I'm Dr. John Steele and a neurologist who, with neuropathologist Jerzy Olszewski, assisted Dr. Richardson to describe progressive supranuclear palsy in 1964. In the 1950s, in Toronto, neurologist Clifford Richardson identified an unusual disease whose hallmark was progressive supranuclear gaze palsy. His first patient, a Canadian executive, could follow to either side through a full range. This film was made in 1959 when the patient was 56 years of age. At this time, the face was spastic. He was dysarthric. He could not look up and down, and he was quite unable to follow Dr. Richardson's pen moving slowly in the vertical plane. But when his head was passively flexed and extended, his eyes moved through a full range reflexly in the opposite direction as occurs when a doll's head is similarly positioned. Here he is attempting to look down at his watch, but as you see, he is unable to do so. When his neck is flexed, however, his eyes deviate up and he cannot move them down. Richardson's second case was an English immigrant and a truck driver. His gait was slow and unsteady, and there was considerable axial extension. Here you see his difficulty in searching and picking an object from the chair because he cannot look down and his neck is extended. He has a very stiff spastic face, marked dysarthria, and a prominent vertical gaze palsy with preservation of oculocephalic reflexes. Richardson's third case was a Ukrainian laborer and a veteran of World War I. By 1958, when age 66, his walking was slow and awkward, and he had particular difficulty in truncal movement, suggesting an apraxia. Here we see a tendency to reel and fall backwards when rising and walking. Notice his spastic, upturned face and neck, very prominent blepharospasm, and the marked limitation of following movements of the eyes in both the vertical and horizontal planes. Many confuse it with Parkinson's disease and also with Alzheimer's disease. The Societies for Progressive Supranuclear Palsy in the United States and in Europe have joined together to produce this video to show diagnostic features of progressive supranuclear palsy. We feel it will assist physicians to make this diagnosis precisely and accurately. We also feel this knowledge will be helpful to families and to patients to know the prognosis of the illness and to anticipate what lies ahead. Both societies are conducting active programs of research and we hope their efforts will result in the understanding of the cause of this disorder and will lead to an effective cure in years ahead. PSP is the result of loss of neurons and glial cells in areas including the cerebral cortex, particularly the frontal and motor areas, basal ganglia, a few areas of thalamus, many brainstem nuclei, particularly in the ocular gaze control centers of the midbrain and pons, a few areas of cerebellum, and even certain areas of the spinal cord all the way down to the parasympathetic nucleus at its caudal end. The resemblance to Parkinson's disease is explained by the fact that both disorders feature important involvement of the dopaminergic substantia nigra. But unlike Parkinson's disease, dopamine replacement therapy does little for PSP, probably because, unlike in Parkinson's disease, there is degeneration of downstream centres bearing dopamine receptors. Virtually all neurodegenerative disorders have recently come to be understood as disorders of protein aggregation and PSP is no exception. A normal protein called tau forms abnormal accumulations called neurofibrillary tangles for reasons that are as yet unclear. There is a weak genetic component consisting of a slight overrepresentation of a variant of the tau gene on chromosome 17, but there are very few other clues to its cause. A population of 100,000 
includes one to two diagnosed cases of PSP plus another four or five who remain undiagnosed. This is about 5% of the prevalence of Parkinson's disease. The average survival in PSP is six to eight years after symptom onset. This is about two years less than for Parkinson's disease before the L-DOPA era. PSP is really not so rare a disease as was originally thought. There are about five or six people out of every 100,000 population who have PSP. But in addition, there may be many more who have the earliest subtle signs of the disease and aren't yet diagnosable even by the most expert neurologist. The prevalence of PSP is similar to that of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, known in Europe as motor neuron disease and in the States as Lou Gehrig disease. The way we make a diagnosis of PSP in the clinic on a daily basis has a bit of informality to it. We do use the accepted criteria that have been published, but they're useful mainly when recruiting people to be in a research study. The way we make the diagnosis of PSP on a more daily basis is to use a whole set of signs and uh, appearances that the person has. For example, the person with PSP will have an upright posture, they'll have a contracted face that's been likened to the look of somebody who's just smelled something bad, it looks kind of like that, and they're walking, their gait will have a very distinctive appearance. It'll be an irregular walk, there will be a wide base between the feet as if the person were drunk, and perhaps most important, the person seems relatively apathetic or not caring about how severe their balance problem really is. So they tend to plunge ahead with their unbalanced gait and they can often get into difficulty with that. Other things that PSP can offer by way of diagnostic clues are the very characteristic speech pattern. It's called a spastic speech in combination with an ataxic speech. So the, the speech is very strained and slow and in addition the syllables are grouped into unnatural groups with unnatural pauses between them. It's a very distinctive kind of speech that occurs in almost no other condition. So the combination of these things together is a very good clue to the diagnosis of PSP, even in its earliest stages. A complaint of unsteadiness and difficulty in walking is a common presenting feature of PSP. The gait is broad-based, ataxic, and is often unkindly described as the gait of a drunken sailor or a dancing bear. There is often preserved arm swing in contrast to Parkinson's disease, and the gait is frequently reckless in that patients seem to be unaware of the dangers that they are running by getting up quickly from a seated position and moving faster than their brain seems to be able to uh, dictate. This leads to damaging and dangerous falls, particularly backwards. Another complaint is of blurring of vision and occasionally double vision, uh, which can be one of the earliest presenting features of PSP. This is due to a disturbance of eye movements and difficulties in keeping the eyelids open to voluntary control. Some patients will have involuntary eye closure, particularly when talking or watching television, which is called blepharospasm or apraxia of eyelid opening. And others will have difficulties negotiating stairs uh, because of a difficulty in looking down. Eye movements form a particularly important part of the neurological examination in PSP and the classical findings are of slowness of vertical eye movements together with limitation of eye movements. The formal neurological examination involves the patient being asked to look up, look down, look to the right and look to the left with the examiner monitoring the degree of normal movement and the speed of movement. The patient is then asked to follow an object, either a finger or a pen, uh, 
up, down, and horizontally. Can you follow the target with your eyes? And finally, the doll's eye movements are tested. These involve flexing the neck with the patient being instructed to continue to follow a finger held in the horizontal plane. In contrast to the marked limitation and slowness of eye movements to command and pursuit, doll's eye movements are preserved in PSP, giving a greater extent and range of movements than one sees to the voluntary command. There are a number of other neurological conditions which can masquerade as PSP and it is obviously important to try and exclude these as much as possible on the history and on the physical examination. In the history we ask always about a previous history of encephalitis because some forms of viral encephalitis can uh, look very like uh, PSP uh, particularly the sleepy sickness of von Economo's disease, although this is now uh, quite a rare disorder. We also ask about a history of visual hallucinations, psychosis and memory loss, as these are more indicative of a condition called dementia with Lewy bodies, which can also simulate and look sometimes rather like PSP. On the physical examination, it is important to exclude autonomic dysfunction and signs of autonomic failure. This is done by checking lying and standing blood pressures, inquiring about whether the patient is still able to perspire and sweat normally, and also in inquiries about bladder function. Uh, these sorts of symptoms are more commonly associated with Parkinson's disease and a neurodegenerative disorder called MSA, which is much rarer, but which can look very like PSP, particularly in the early stages. Uh, it is also important to exclude uh, a related condition to PSP called corticobasal degeneration, sometimes abbreviated to CBD. In contrast to PSP, this condition usually begins in one limb and is very asymmetrical. Uh, the limb usually has jerky, tremulous movements in it and may be, uh, have the features of what is called an alien limb. Uh, this is a symptom where the limb of a patient feels as if it doesn't anymore belong to them and it will carry out uh, unwanted movements against the voluntary control of the patient. Uh, these are all very important things that need to be uh, eliminated uh, before one can go on to saying that this is PSP. The formal diagnostic criteria are quite simple. Number one, the person has to be older than 40 at the onset. There has to be gradual progression of the signs and symptoms. In other words, they would have to get worse as time is going by. There, has to be, there have to be falls in the first year. Um, if the falls are much delayed, it would, might mean some other diagnosis. And there has to be vertical gaze palsy, in other words, difficulty looking up or more specifically looking down. In addition, there has to be an absence of evidence for competing diagnostic possibilities. The clinical investigations I use routinely in patients suspected of having PSP are very few. There are no blood tests or any other chemical investigations that are important. The only thing I order consistently is an MRI of the brain. Occasionally, I will also order a SPECT scan of the brain to look at blood flow and uh, decreased metabolic activity in the frontal areas. Imaging procedures play only a minor role in the diagnosis of PSP. They serve mainly to exclude other considerations such as multi-infarct states, hydrocephalus and other lesions of the brainstem and basal ganglia. The changes of PSP on MRI or CT scanning fall into the category of supportive criteria as they are relatively specific but not particularly sensitive. The principal changes seen on MRI are atrophy of the midbrain disproportionate to the atrophy seen in the pons or the cerebellum, which may be more atrophied 
in multiple system atrophy compared to PSP. There's also disproportionate atrophy of the superior cerebellar peduncle, and one may see atrophy in the frontal lobes and the anterior part of the temporal lobes. On this T1-weighted MRI scan, the midbrain atrophy is clearly evident, particularly when compared to that seen in multiple system atrophy. On this sagittal image, the disproportionate atrophy of the midbrain is much more obvious, but if the scan slices a bit off of the midline, then this finding may be missed. On axial and coronal images, it is also possible to visualise atrophy of the superior cerebellar peduncle. Many other imaging techniques, such as diffusion-weighted imaging, have been evaluated in PSP, and some of these can differentiate it from Parkinson's disease. However, none of these new imaging techniques have been shown to be good at differentiating PSP from other conditions in the earliest stages of the disease, and it is at this early stage, when the clinical signs are at their most subtle, that a good diagnostic test is most needed. The cause of PSP is not yet known, but we know there's some genetic component. One mutation increases the risk of PSP by five or tenfold. That's located in the tau gene on chromosome 17. Search for other genes that, that assist the tau gene in causing the disease are underway. In addition, there is work going on in looking for some kind of environmental toxin that might contribute to the cause of PSP. This work is inspired by the observation that a PSP-like illness is very common on certain isolated islands where unusual dietary practices are followed. The PSP societies in the United States and England are supporting active programs of research into the disorder. They are also providing support to patients and families and are advocates for caregiving and understanding of the disease. We hope that you will support the efforts of research by the societies and that you will make patients and their families aware of the services that are provided by these societies. We thank you very much for viewing this video and uh, we hope it has been of interest and help to you, the physician who cares for these patients.